I would like to get some response to this. I know, and man, I say I'd like to get some response. The turban is hot. Like people are, they're constantly talking okay. in the turban. So we'll keep going. But here's the question. Has authenticity trumped holiness? Now think about that because you hear that word a lot. I mm-hmm. want to be authentic. Yeah. I want to be real. And when somebody shares something, you're like, man, that's real talk. Yeah. That's yeah. real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. now we've kind of begun to put that on the pedestal as like almost it's a substitute for being holy that you're sinful but you're able to tell people about it. Ooh. Mm, wait, Ooh. say that again? Yeah. That has almost trumped mm. aiming for holiness, mm. being sinful, and sinful and being willing to tell people about it. Because that's authentic. Because that's real. That's, that's real. Talk real. And being that's transparent. real. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That gives you street cred. Hmm. And so that's a problem because when you start to put that above striving for holiness – Then what we have really, according to this article, and I'm going to share a little bit with you. Okay. What we have really is we have a group of people almost beginning to find it cool to sort of glory in their sin. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because who, who, who can be most real right now? Let's go around the room. Anybody struggling with anything? (laughs) Yeah, we all are. Now think about it. Think about it though. The person in the circle. Now come on. Uh huh. The person in the circle who says, you know, I'm, I'm okay right now. Like I'm, you know, I, mm-hmm. I've really, I've been striving to live holy yeah, and, yeah. you know, for right now, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I mean, you know, think about what, what do people, oh, she thinks she better than everybody. Cause you're not, that person is not saying I'm without, without No, sin. it's just like, well, I'm not, I'm not I don't have anything right now okay. that is something I'm battling or something that I feel like I need to confess. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. But if you go around the room and everybody's like, yeah, man, I've been gossiping. Every time I leave work, I got extra pins in my hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're all of a sudden authentic. Let me read a little bit of this article for you here. Uh, in recent years, evangelical Christianity has made its imperfection a point of emphasis. This is really interesting. Books were published with titles like, quote, messy spirituality, God's annoying love for imperfect people. Death by church, and Jesus wants to save Christians. The article goes on to say churches have popped up with names like Scum of the Earth and Salvage Yard. I wouldn't even tell people <laughs> I go to a church called even... Scum of the yeah, Earth. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh... Scum, come, are you sick? That's <laughs> just too much. Yeah. That's too much. Who does that? Anyway. Evangelicals made films like Lord Save Us from Your Followers. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. And wrote blog posts with titles like Dirty, Rotten, Messy Christians. Maintained websites like Anchored Mess, mm. Modern Reject, Recovering Evangelical. Wow. He goes on, he says, evangelicalism, both on the individual and institutional level, is trying hard to purge itself of a polished veneer that smacked of hypocrisy. But by focusing on brokenness as proof of our realness and authenticity, have evangelicals termed being screwed up, I'm quoting, I'm reading here, into a badge of honor in its own sort of works righteousness? Has authenticity become a higher calling than, say, holiness hmm. that's a that's a big big question it is it's a big big question but then here's something else interesting in in the article because this this writer goes on to to kind of quote uh what some people see as the church's need to get back to realness okay saying quote we don't want to be fooled anymore we don't want to be gullible anymore we we want flawed we want imperfect We want real. But the author is responding to these kinds of these kinds of of assertions with this. Why does real have to be synonymous with flawed and imperfect? When someone opens up about their junk, we think, oh, you're being real and Mm -hmm. we can relate to them. Mm -hmm. But what about the pastor? And this is good. What about the pastor who has served faithfully for decades without scandal, loved his wife and family, Embody the fruit of the spirit. Is this less real? Hmm. It almost seems like that's kind of what we're saying. That's what. And look, this ties into what we've been dealing with 
I feel like in some areas of Christian hip hop. Yeah. This this I'm bent on being real. So I play down the fact that God requires holiness. Let me talk about how I'm not holy. Wow. You, you, yeah, you see yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? I and, see it. and and you can almost begin to set that as the standard. Holiness is still the standard. Yeah. Yeah. Holiness is still the standard. Someone in our turban, let me, let me, um, let me just hover here. Who is that? Not the cool mom says, sometimes it's about being relevant. Other times it seems to be a way um to excuse not growing. Mm. Yeah, exactly right. And that's that is exactly the point that this article is is making. They interviewed one woman, a young woman in her twenties, by the name of Becky, who's who lives in Los Angeles. Um, she says there's a sweet spot of authenticity. Now listen to this. She says there's a sweet spot of authenticity. Like if you reveal that you struggle with gossip, people are like, whoopee. But then there's some sins that you might share where it's like, whoa, that's too much. Yeah. There has to be a middle ground. Like I'm struggling with wanting to sleep with my boyfriend. See, that's the sweet spot where people see you as really vulnerable and authentic and it's required admission. But what about I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. Mm. Well, now let's deal with it. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? It's kind of yeah. like just close enough to that imperfect line. And, you know, you, you see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. To where it gives you some <clears throat> kind of some kind of like human credibility. And I'm yeah. not trying to we're human. We live in this flesh. We know the things that we deal with. Mm -hmm. But I think to continue to put that as and, and that's why as I read this, I was like, man, this is really good, Will. This is really good. It's like, you know, um, to continue to set being real, like, you, I'm going to keep it 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay, but in so doing, also keep it holy. Mm. As, long as, as long as whatever your confession is does not to you seem like victory. That's not the victory. Yeah. Right? Right. The confession of the sin is not the victory. That's, that's the first step. Yeah. That's the first step, actually confessing it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and that's uh, I think that's um, the right step. You know, I wonder heading I, I heading know. heading into victory. I don't think that's the complete victory because what sin, what I've what I've learned about sin is that it loves to stay in the dark. So right. when you do confess, that's a big part in leading to the victory. Mm -hmm. You know, because it exposes you and you say, "Hey, you know, I want to be right. I want to do right." So. You know, I'm going to get this out because if it stays in the darkness, mm -hmm. it thrives. That's right. So. That's right. This writer goes on and says uh, this dynamic of trying to keep it 100, trying to keep it real mm -hmm. uh, reflects another problem. Our skewed understanding of sin. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if our sins have become a currency. Listen to this. It's almost and talking about believers. OK, it's almost as if our sins have become a currency of solidarity. Something we pat each other on the back about as fellow, authentic, broken people. Hmm. Yeah, you, you, yeah, me too, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, me too. But then he says this, but sin should always be grieved rather than mm. celebrated. Wow. Sin should That's be true. grieved. That's true. Rather when, than celebrated. When we understand what sin is and what it, and what it does to our relationship with God, it is a, a a thing that should be grieved, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I think, I think in that lies the problem. I don't think we see sin like we should see it. That's right. Be I, and I agree with you. Because if we knew the effects of it on our relationship with God, That's right. you know, and where places, you know, I think we would, it would be, there would be a more ser a serious, more seriousness about, about sin, mm -hmm. you know, and staying away from it and keeping the leaven out, you know, That's stuff, right. you know, but our, our understanding about it is as not far away from the line. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I, I really feel like what the church does is the church follows the lead of culture mm -hmm. where the church is supposed to be affecting culture. We're supposed to be salt and light, but as it is, it's like, you know, we kind of, we wait to see the direction the world goes in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we kind of like, okay, well then let's do that. Yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? Right. And that's, Anyway, and, and here's another quote from the article. Um, this writer says, we, we've become too comfortable with our sin to the point that it's how we identify ourselves and relate to others. But shouldn't we find connection over Christ rather than over our depravity? Hmm. And I think there's I think there is a there is a, a balance. You know what I'm saying? Like you when you realize just how 
utterly broken and ruined you are. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That that that's a great place to start on your journey and moving towards the Lord. But <laughs> to try to let that be the place that we constantly connect with one another, where we constantly move closer to each other, because you know, I'm I'm shacking too. Mm. I'm shacking too. Because I, I think you know you have to. I remember one time. I remember one time. Um, Man, you know, and, you know, just on campus and talking to a girl, and I, I was still in college at this time, and I remember us walking walking along campus. We were leaving class, and I was trying to challenge her in her relationship with God, you know, challenge her to walk, you know. And she said, she said, yeah, you know, she said, Miki, we are always going to um, not feel like we are in a good place. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Basically... I don't even know why you why you tell people to strive or to press. You're never uh, gonna feel like we'll you're in perfect, a uh, right, that right, kind right. Of thing. And I said, you know what? There's a hint of truth to that. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that you can get to a place in the Lord where you are reassured that you're living a life that's pleasing to Him. Yeah. Because I think the former statement is a cop out statement. It says, I don't strive towards God because I'm never gonna please Him. No, on your own, you're not. We know in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? We are pleasing to God. But you can live a life that lines up with your profession. Amen. Anyway, until next time. God bless.